Welcome back to the Choosing Simple podcast. I'm your host, Amy Fuel. Modern day life can be hard to navigate, but even a simple homestead life can be, well, not so simple. In the Choosing Simple podcast, I talk about embracing real, raw emotions in real life in moments of motherhood, womanhood, and just this incredible homesteading lifestyle. Simplicity doesn't just happen. It's a choice we have to make every single day. So whether you're a tired mama washing dishes at 11 p.m. or a woman gardener battling bugs, this podcast is for you. Let's talk about real life. Let's talk about choosing simple in today's podcast. Okay, so for those of you watching on YouTube, I am up super early, 5 a.m. in the morning, and so I might have bags under my eyes, and I might look really tired, but that's beside the point. If you're listening on the podcast, you don't care at all, but either way, I am really excited about today's episode. This is something that people have been asking me to put together for quite some time now. I have my handy dandy herb notebook here with me um, and I have been making lots of notes over the past couple of weeks for you guys. Um, If you want more in-depth information on these herbs and if you want the herbal profile for these herbs, which is basically a sheet that you can print off with all of the information that I'm talking about, about each individual herb, then you can join my Homestead Herbalist membership which I will link in the show notes, Uh, and we talk about all kinds of things over there, and you get these fun printables for you. Otherwise, make sure you pull out a pen or a pencil and a notebook and start taking notes for today's episode, because today we are talking about, I think there's about 22 herbs, medicinal herbs, that you really should have in your apothecary cabinet for a crisis situation or as we like to say the apocalypse now when I say the apocalypse please know that uh, I don't mean like the true apocalypse you know if we're talking about a biblical apocalypse normally uh, us Christians know that we're probably not going to be here for a biblical apocalypse but I think it's really important to remember that there are generations before us who have lived in worse conditions than us um, who have who have gone through worse things than we have, and it could get there again. And what we don't understand is that we've been here for quite some time on this earth, and we have seen different eras of generations that have survived through worse situations than we could ever imagine. And I think it's interesting as Christians, we're like, oh, we'll be taken, you know, God will take us before that happens. Well, I I don't quite believe that way because simply of looking back on history. So this is for you too. But um, if we are talking about, you know, we're not talking about anything spiritual. We're talking about hard times that are coming and maybe you can't get to a hospital or maybe the healthcare system is just wacko and you don't want to go. You really need to start considering learning some portions of herbalism because you will be your own doctor and maybe even your community doctor. Um, that is kind of crazy to think about, but, um, you know, when hard times come, there's always a, an herbalist that kind of rises up in communities and and they're the ones who treat people because they're the ones with the knowledge. So at least for your family, um, make sure that you start learning about herbalism because it's extremely important in times like these. All right, I've made a list of these herbs. I'm going to go through them fairly in-depth, but not incredibly in-depth um, about what they are and what they do and what their dosage are is, sorry. Uh, and then um, we're going to see kind of how we touch on every body part and symptom and need. So these are the herbs. This is not a, a Google Herbalist uh, podcast episode or video where they give you like kitchen herbs, which are also great. I do have some of those in here. Uh, but this is, this is from me to you an herbalist saying you need to consider purchasing these and making your protocols that will last for 20 years, or you really need to consider growing these if they're in your grow zone. I, I don't have listed all the grow zones. If I know that some are easy to grow in your general grow zone, then I will tell you. Okay. The first herb that we're going to talk about today 
is yarrow. A lot of you who have been dabbling into herbalism probably know this herb. It's one of the most functional and well-beloved herbs in herbalism. Uh, and so the parts used for yarrow are the aerial parts. So when I say aerial parts, that, that normally means the top parts. So the flowers and the leaves, and sometimes even the stem, uh, can, is considered an aerial part. And so yarrow is a diaphoretic, a hypotensive, astringent, anti-inflammatory, antispasmodic, diuretic, antimicrobial, bitter, and heptic. And some of you are like, what in the world did you just say? Um, if you, again, if you're part of my Homestead Herbalist group, I do have a definition list of what all of these mean. Uh, for herbalists who know these words, that's why I'm saying them. Um, you know them already, but if you want to know what they are, you can check out that list in the membership group. But in layman's terms, I'm going to tell you what this herb does. I love yarrow. I love foraging for yarrow. I love growing yarrow. Yarrow generally grows well in most areas. Uh, here in the United States. So it's good for fever. It's really, really great for fever, digestion, infections, because it is an antimicrobial. Uh, so it's wonderful for infections, um, great for hypertension, wound healing, uh, and it stops bleeding. So I always make a little bit of a powder with yarrow. Um, when you have a bleeding wound, even a very large bleeding wound, you can pour that powder in there and it will actually stop the bleeding. Um, so it's wonderful for wound healing. So you can see why straight out the door, yarrow is on my list of herbs to have for an impending apocalypse. Like if you are bleeding, number one, you need yarrow. Um, it's great for colds, especially respiratory colds, uh, diarrhea, and other kind of GI issues, uh, including dysentery. And then it's also great for uterine uterine hemorrhage. Um, so again, it, it has that blood clotting ability. So you really want yarrow in your back pocket um, when you're kind of putting together your your apothecary for a situation like this. Uh, yarrow is not recommended to use for pregnancy while you're pregnant. Um, and a tincture dosage is two to four milliliters three times a day. So a tincture... Um, if you don't know what that is, you can look it up online. I generally just take a vodka or an alcohol of 80% or more, and you add uh, uh, four parts of your herb in, um, or one part of your herb, sorry, in four parts to five parts of your alcohol. I highly recommend that you weigh your herbs and your alcohol. Um, I've gone over this before. I go over this extensively in my courses and my membership. Um, but that's the general gist of it. You let it sit for four to six weeks, you strain it off, and then you have a tincture. All right, next herb is agrimony. Uh, the parts used for agrimony are aerial parts. Um, a lot of you are going to be hearing herbs that you maybe have never studied before or heard of, um, and that's great because you're learning something new. So, uh, so agrimony is an astringent, a tonic, bitter, diuretic, vulnerary, antispasmatic, diaphoretic. It's carminative. It's hep hepatic and um, it's a really good herb. <laughs> I really like this herb. So agrimony is great for digestive issues, especially childhood diarrhea. Um, that's really important. Uh, you can look at different people groups in history and see that they maybe lost a lot of their population or family group due to um, diarrhea and bacteria. And so having something on hand that's good in treating that is very important, especially for children. Uh, it's also a, a bitter stimulant of the digestive and liver secretions. Uh, it helps with indigestion and early stage appendicitis. Have you ever wondered what you're going to do when you are in a crisis or apocalyptic situation and your appendix is hurting you or your gallbladder is hurting you. The traditional modern medicine teaches us that we have to have a doctor. We have to go to the hospital and get it taken out right now. And yes, there are situations where that has to happen. And there are situations where, um, even especially in the Egyptians that those surgeries took place, but there are herbs like agrimony that can actually help, um, get rid of those issues, uh, especially early stage appendicitis for agrimony is, is a great herb to use. And so when we have these tools in our tool bag, 
for these apocalyptic situations and we are confident in using them, it is so empowering to know, it, it is so comforting to know that we we know what we're talking about. We can use this herb that God gave us to use for healing. The Bible says that God gave us plants for healing and that it's right there. It's right in our medical bag at home and we don't have to rush to the hospital. What if there is no hospital and it's just us? You can have confidence in learning about these things and you should be learning about them so that you can take care of your family during a situation like this. And so seeing that agrimony kind of touches on one of those severe um, health situations is really comforting to me, at least, to know that I have that option and I could fix this issue if it arises in a crisis situation. Um, It also uh, helps with colitis, urinary uh, incontinence, cystitis. Sometimes I have a hard time saying these words. Uh, You can use it as a gargle for sore throat and laryngitis, and it heals wounds and bruises. So another herb that heals wounds and bruises. There are no known safety concerns with agrimony, um, and the tincture dosage is one to four milliliters, three times a day. All right, the next herb we are going to talk about is one you'll hear me talk about a lot. I add this herb to my elderberry syrup every year, and that is astragalus. Um, The astragalus root is what's used for this particular herb, and it is known as an immunomodulator. When you look at the actions of the herb, it just says immunomodulator. And so basically, it's an immune system simulator. It protects the liver, and it also has anti-cancer effects. It may interact with immunosuppressant drugs, so just keep that in mind. I, I tell this story a lot. I have a friend whose daughter was um, on a liver transplant medication, and um, she actually had to stop taking astragalus because her body was rejecting the, it was interacting with the liver medication, transplant medication. So it started rejecting the liver. So just keep that in mind uh, for people who have cancer, who are on immunosuppressive drugs or people with transplants, especially. Um, So astragalus is one of those herbs that you absolutely need because it helps your immune system adapt to things around you. It helps support your immune system in every way possible. Um, It really helps you fight off those colds and flus and viruses before they even get started. So preventative care with astragalus and even after you get sick is extremely important. The next herb we're going to talk about are oats. You might think oats, like oats meal? Well, basically, but the plant form of it. Um, Avena sativa, we use this a lot in herbalism. The whole plant is used, but especially the milky, um, the milky top parts are used especially for herbalism. Uh, So it is a very good tonic. It is an antidepressant, a nutritive, a demulcent, and a vulnerary. Um, So it does a lot of amazing things, and it, it feeds the nervous system, it helps with depression and anxiety, and it treats general debility. So um, we use milky oats a lot for people who deal with anxiety, which in an apocalyptic situation, that is something that you're going to see a lot. Um, it, it helps calm the central nervous system as well. So if you're in my Homestead Herbalist group, then you've heard me say uh, that we use this herb a lot, the, those milky top of part of the oat plant, um, to help with healing the central nervous system. So this is extremely, extremely important um, when you are building your apothecary uh, to have something like this because you never know when you might have a virus uh, attack your central nervous system or when you just need central nervous system healing or just for the simple fact that some people are going to have anxiety and depression and they're not going to have any of those pharmaceuticals to help them through that and so this is a really great option. Okay, next on the herb list is cayenne, and yes, this is a kitchen herb, and uh, but it has some really incredible parts. So cayenne, when I say cayenne, I'm talking about the fruit, not the pepper plant. Uh, I mean, it's a pepper plant, but we're using the fruit of the pepper plant, which is the pepper. Um, it's a stimulant. It's carbonative. It is anti-catarrhal. It is, oh, I can't even read my own writing here. 
uh, antimicrobial. Uh, it's a systemic stimulant. So it stimulates blood flow. It strengthens heart, arteries, capillaries, and, and the nervous system. Uh, it wards off colds. Uh, it promotes circulation and a gargle for sore throat and laryngitis works it works wonders on that. I've used that many times. It also helps with neuropathy. Oh, by the way, there's no known safety issues with the oats. Uh, and the tincture dosage is three to five milliliters, three to three times a day. I forgot to add that. Um, cayenne can cause some skin irritation for some people. Uh, but for most people, it, it doesn't. It might it might cause a burning sensation, but doesn't actually burn your skin. Cayenne is great um, not only for – so it, it's a stimulant. It stimulates blood flow specifically. Um, and so externally and internally, um, if you have an issue with blood flow, circulation, getting to a certain area, rubbing a cayenne um, – Rubbing a cayenne ointment or just cayenne with some oil in general uh, on that place that needs circulation will bring circulation back there. Uh, it also is great to like wake you up. You know how people pass out? Um, it stimulates the nervous system in if you were to put it in, in the mouth or whatnot or sniff it or smell it, it would wake you up really fast. So if somebody's passed out, cayenne is a great option. Um, it's great for respiratory. If somebody's having a respiratory issue, respiratory distress, uh, even like asthma, it can help clear those airways. But it can also do the same thing. It, 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 you have to be careful with asthmatics and cayenne because it can also stimulate an asthmatic reaction if you're not careful with it. So cayenne is a really great, great option because of those things. Um, and it should definitely be in your apothecary for this reason. Okay, next is balmony. Have you ever heard of this, this herb? Uh, <laughs> probably not. Uh, it is heptic, it's a bitter, it is anti-emetic, it's a stimulant, and it's a laxative. Uh, so, hold on, I forgot your cayenne dosage again. I keep forgetting your dosages. Cayenne has no known safety precautions. Dosage is 0.25 to 1 milliliter three times a day if you're taking it as a tincture. Otherwise, most of the time it's used externally. That's why I forgot to tell you. Um, okay. Balmany, uh, parts used are the dried aerial parts, and so it is great for liver and digestive. Uh, it's a great digestive tonic. It treats gallstones. Uh, it's inflammation, so it specifically treats inflammation of the gallbladder and jaundice that is simulated by the gallbladder and liver. Um, it stimulates appetite. It eases colic. It helps with malnutrition and malabsorption. And it also helps with roundworms. Um, there are no known safety precautions with Balmany. A tincture dosage is one to two milliliters three times a day. So this, I, I added this to the apothecary group because it's good specifically for the liver, the digestive tract, and for your gallbladder. So we already um, treated the appendix. Now we're going to the gallbladder. And Balmany is specifically known, specifically known to help treat gallstones and gallbladder issues. So... Again, one of those herbs that you want to feel confident in using, and it makes you feel more confident uh, in treating your family that you have now that you know you'll have that on hand. Uh, next is fringe tree. This is actually really common in most of the United States. Uh, it grows wild in a lot of places, and you would use the bark of the fringe tree. Um, it's heptic, alterative, diuretic, tonic, antiemetic, laxative. Uh, I never say this word right. Col Cologog. <laughs> I have no idea. All right. Uh, it helps with your liver. It helps with your liver. It also helps with gallbladder inflammation. Again, uh, gallstones. It stimulate, stimulates the release of bile. Liver congestion. It helps with liver congestion. Acute jaundice. Childhood jaundice. Malarial conditions. Uh, sugar and urine and typhoid fever. So you can kind of see why I added this herb, especially for the malarial conditions and typhoid fever and the childhood jaundice. So this is an issue. I mean, most of the time childhood jaundice is not an issue for, for babies, um, but it could be. 
And so that's a really good herb to have on hand for that condition. And then especially typhoid fever and malarial conditions, because you have to think, if you go back to the previous episode, we were talking about um, unique items you might need for an apocalyptic situation. We were talking about the book One Second After, and those types of diseases started showing up again, those types of issues like malaria and typhoid fever and all of these things. Um, I don't know if that will happen in a real life situation scenario, but it's good to have them on hand if it does. People before us figured these things out. This this fringe tree grows wild uh, and you can cultivate it as well. So um, just keep that in mind. I'm trying to cover all of the bases here of herbs that you know you might need for various different reasons, not just general health. Uh, and so we're getting the heavy hitters here in some of these. All right, the next herb, and we use this here in our house frequently, is hawthorn. And we use the berry, flower, or leaf, but generally we use the berry. You might hear a newborn in the background, or an infant now. <laughs> uh, all right, so this is a cardiotonic, diuretic, astringent, hypotensive. It's mostly good for your heart. That's what we use hawthorn for. I use it for a couple of people uh in my household. Um, so it's great for the cardiovascular system. It's good for cardiovascular disease. It improves coronary circulation, reduces angina attacks, uh, keeps your heart healthy, helps with hypertension and myocarditis. Hawthorne is an incredible, incredible plant. Um, it's funny because a lot of these plants that help with, uh, <laughs> that help with, um, general things like heart issues and hypertension these herbs these plants are so let me tell you the story i have been looking for hawthorn berry and i've asked a couple of greenhouse owners and they're like no we don't sell that because it's it carries a lot of disease with it which could be entirely true uh but i think that that's what just governments have said because these plants are medicine and the heart pharmaceutical industry is a big industry just like the cancer industry and um so i think it's really funny when i can't find plants uh, and they're often almost every time the reason is because they say well they carry a lot of disease with them and they might infect other plants or they're an invasive species uh, so i think that's really funny but uh, Hawthorne is great for heart issues. So if you have people having heart arrhythmias, uh, skipping heartbeats, palpitations, all of those things, Hawthorne is your herb that you need to have in that apothecary. Uh, any kind of cardiovascular disease or issues, Hawthorne berry is the way to go. Two and a half to three milliliters three times a day. It can enhance the activity of cardioactive drugs. So if you are taking cardioactive drugs, which you wouldn't be during the apocalypse because you wouldn't be able to get it, uh, it can enhance that activity. All right, next herb on the list is echinacea. We all know echinacea, right? We're going to fly through this, maybe. Uh, echinacea purpurea or angustifolia. Angustifolia is the original echinacea that the Native Americans use, so just uh, consider that when you're buying your seeds. The root of echinacea is used. You can also use the flower heads and leaves, but it does not have the potency that the root has. I've seen a lot of people... Um, use the flower head and leaf and that's fine it does have a lot of medicinal value but if you're really looking for the heavy hitting medicinal portion of the plant it is the root uh, echinacea is antimicrobial it's an immunomodulator anti-inflammatory anti-catarrhal vulnerary and alterative it's great for microbiobi microbiobial it's great for microbial infections, bacterial and viral attacks, boils, infection in general, especially of the upper respiratory tract, and it has activity against strep and staph infections, multiple studies on that, and also has been studied well for influenza. So we're putting echinacea on here for infections specifically of the respiratory tract and just general infection, even with the urinary tract. Um, strep and staph infections, echinacea is your go-to herb. Uh, echinacea may cause an allergic reaction for people allergic to plants in the Asteraceae family. Many interfere with immuno, uh, it may interfere with immunosuppressant drugs as well. Tincture is one to four milliliters three times a day. Uh, so echinacea is on here for, it's not on here for its immune stimulating abilities. It's actually on here for infection. Um, echinacea is widely known for treating infections. 
So um, definitely want that in your apothecary. Uh, next is an herb you probably haven't really heard of. It's called ephedra or ephedra. And uh, it's also called mehong in Chinese medicine. Uh, the parts used are the stem, specifically the stem. This is a very, very hard herb to find if you're trying to find it dried. It's very hard to find. I had to import it one time. Uh, it is a vasodilator, hypotensive, circulatory stimulant, and anti-allergic. So ephedra or ephedra, however you would like to say it, um, it is exactly as it sounds, very much like uh, ephedrine. And uh, so it treats asthma. <clears throat> it, re it relaxes um, your airways. And it is essentially ephedrine. What, we, what, what the pharmaceutical world calls ephedrine is made from ephedra. Uh, it helps with nasal and sinus congestions, uh, nasus, nasal and sinus pressure, bronchitis. It eases allergic reactions. Uh, it helps with uh, circulatory inefficiency and even blood pressure. Uh, it can produce cardiac arrhythmias uh, using with other medications such as oxytocin can cause fatal hypertension. Do not use it if you have thyroid disease, diabetes, cardiovascular conditions, or prostate enlargement. Those are the safety precautions for ephedra. Uh, tincture dosage is one to four milliliters one to three times a day. So I added this because I personally was, I'm always looking for uh, herbs that relax the airways. We have one child that had asthma growing up. We have another child that has asthmatic tendencies, which means he doesn't have asthma, but he does have asthmatic tendencies when he gets sick. Um, and we also have an infant that we don't know uh, what she'll have. So I, I don't believe that she'll have any issues, uh, but you never know. Um, and you never know when someone might have an allergic reaction to something. And what do you do when EpiPens and other uh, things are not available? Then you need to find something to put into your apothecary to try to combat that. So the ephedra is wonderful for that. And uh, it's, it's a great herb. I actually do not have this herb in my apothecary yet. And it is going to be in my apothecary very soon. Uh, you can grow it, but it tends to be, uh, grows more in the Asian continents uh, where it is much warmer than the, the United States. All right, next is Eyebrite. I use Eyebrite frequently, and I highly recommend you learn about it. Uh, this is another one of those herbs that they say it is an invasive species, and maybe it is, but it is. Uh, it can be cultivated sustainably and safely. Uh, so I write the dried aerial parts are what's used. It's anti-catarrhal, it's stringent, and it's anti-inflammatory. Specifically, the name I write, a lot of times you'll see this with herbs, the names kind of reflect what they're used for. It is used for mucous membranes, especially pink eye conjunctivitis, uh, sinus congestion, stinging, and weeping eyes. Uh, we use Eyebrite specifically for conjunctivitis, uh, which, aka pink eye. Um, this can be used on your kids, on yourself, and on your animals. So if you have cattle or other animals that are prone to getting pink eye, this herb is very, very good for you to have on hand. There are no known side effects or safety issues. Tincture is one to four milliliters three times a day, or you can use it externally, one teaspoon of dried herbs to a cup of water, um, a, a, like an eight ounce cup of water. Um, it Generally, it's just a great herb, so you don't have to really worry about there being an overdosage or anything like that. But I added this to the apothecary for your apocalyptic apothecary because a lot of people get pink eye, especially kids, and your livestock can get pink eye. And so if you don't treat it very quickly, uh, sometimes it can turn into actually losing that eye or that infection can spread to other places in the body. So for eyebright, you can just make a compress, almost like a tea bag, uh, and dip it and actually lay it on the eye or put the liquid in the eye multiple times a day, and it will get rid of that uh, conjunctivitis pretty quickly. 
All right, next is Meadowsweet. If you are in my Homestead Herbalist membership, you've heard me talk about Meadowsweet extensively. Uh, Meadowsweet, the parts used are the aerial parts. It's anti-rheumatic, anti-inflammatory, carminative, anti-acid, anti-emetic, and astringent. It is most knownly used uh, for its fever reducing abilities. It's also great for the digestive tract. It eases nausea. It's, um, you know, like I said, the GI tract heartburn and it's aspirin like chemicals are what reduce fever. So, um, what you need to do is avoid it. If you have, if you're sensitive to aspirin or the chemicals in it, um, it's called, uh, salicylate or something like that. Um, so dosage is two to four milliliters three time, one to three times a day. Um, so I, I keep Meadowsweet in my apothecary for fever and I actually make a glycerite out of it for kids because most of the time I just need it for, for kids if they get fever and it essentially induces perspiration, which is what breaks the fever, uh, for you. Um, so Meadowsweet is wonderful, but I also added it in here because it eases nausea. And so if you have some nausea sickness in an apocalyptic situation, uh, especially um, pregnant moms that have severe nausea, Meadowsweet is a wonderful herb for that. Uh, the next herb we're talking about is goat's rue. Kind of sounds a little weird, doesn't it? Uh, goat's rue, the parts used are dried aerial parts. You're going to see that a lot. Most herbs are the dried aerial parts and not the root. Uh, goat's rue reduces blood sugar. It stimulates milk flow and production, stimulates the development of mammary glands. So you can kind of see why I added goat's rue. It's specifically on there for nursing mothers. Um, you have to consider in a crisis situation, look at, <laughs> look what we've gone through this year. We have formula shortages and, uh, all of those fun things. Sorry. I just realized that my microphone was not pointed in the right direction. So you may not have heard me very well. Um, yeah, so goat's rue is great for stimulating and producing milk for nursing mothers. And I added that because, you know, in a crisis situation, you could be so stressed out that it affects your milk supply and this would help it. Uh, and then there are also mothers who don't have good development of mammary glands and this would help with that as well. Um, it may potentiate the action of hypoglycemic drugs, uh, so it may enhance those actions because it is used for blood sugar. Hey. All right, the next plant in this uh, podcast is Lobelia. Now, you may not have heard of Lobelia before. It is a very, very fun herb. I actually just ordered some plants myself for our new property. The aerial parts are what are used for this plant. It does grow very well in the United, in the United States, so keep that in mind. Uh, it is anti-asthmatic, anti-spasmatic, expectorant, aminic, and nervine. Uh, I am specifically using it for this apothecary podcast for the anti-asthmatic uh, effects, which I also used uh, for a couple of others. So it helps with bronchial asthma, bronchitis, uh, nicotine. It has nicotine effects, so it can have uh, be good for nicotine addicts. Uh, respiratory depression, whooping cough, croup, epilepsy, tetanus, convulsions, tonsillitis, and pneumonia. So it's got a lot of incredible benefits, Lobelia does. So let's just break them down really quickly. Uh, so bronchial asthma and a respiratory distress are the first big ones. It is an incredible herb to keep on hand. Even if you don't have asthmatic issues in your family, uh, any kind of respiratory distress, Lobelia is necessary. Uh, bronchitis, respiratory depression, again, whooping cough, um, and pneumonia. Those things kind of go together. Really important to have. Whooping cough is, in general, still something that happens in the United States. Even though we have a vaccine, the vaccine has failed many, many, many times. Um, we don't do the vaccine anyhow uh, because it's just, what's the point? Um, a couple years ago, they actually did a study that showed and it was, it made news. You can actually uh, Google it, um, that the whooping cough vaccine didn't even work. Uh, it wore off after like two or three years. So uh, whooping cough is a, is a thing. It's a thing we get. Uh, it's, it's not generally a detrimental thing, uh, but it's good to have Lobelia on hand. If that does happen, especially with your child, whooping cough also goes along with asthmatic tendencies and can cause asthmatic effects. Uh, also great for croup, uh, and then we go into the other things like tetanus 
and um, epilepsy. So it's an anti-convulsion. Um, so it's really great to have on hand, as you can see, for multiple issues should uh, you not be able to get pharmaceuticals for those issues. Uh, lobelia, again, has similar side effects as nicotine and could cause nausea, dizziness, diarrhea, uh, tremors, and it should not be used during pregnancy or lactation for those specific reasons. Uh, dosage is tincture 0.5 to 1 milliliter, so half to 1 full milliliter up to three times a day. Next herb is one of my favorite herbs, and it is German chamomile, and we use the flower head. Chamomile is very, very simple to cultivate on your homestead for your apothecary. Uh, in fact, in uh, the UK and throughout Europe, they used to grow chamomile in place of grass because it was so soft, and uh, it was it was medicinal, and so why not grow it in place of grass? Not everywhere, but just in certain like cottage gardens and things. So I thought that was an interesting tidbit of information that you might like. Uh, chamomile is a nervine, antispasmatic, carminative, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, bitter, and vulnerary. Chamomile is wonderful for insomnia, anxiety, depression. Let's kind of go through that for a second, break that part down. I always put chamomile with my um, oats when I'm treating somebody or when I can't use the word treat, when I'm helping someone. Um, and so chamomile and my milky oats always go together. Uh, then it helps uh, with ulcers and diarrhea. It general uh, calming of your digestive tract. I use chamomile a lot when I was pregnant for indigestion. Works wonders. Um, and and on here I have listed indigestion, uh, aches and pains from influenza, migraines, uh, teething. I use chamomile frequently for my teething children. Uh, vertigo, conjunctivitis. Again, that's the pink eye. So you can use eyebright and chamomile together or one or the other. Inflamed skin. It is also nerve calming and helps with digestive inflammation and indigestion like what I just mentioned. I use chamomile most for the digestive tract. Um, and then that's number one. Second for anxiety, depression, and insomnia. That's number two. And then um, for uh, influenza, migraines, teething and conjunctivitis. Uh, chamomile can cause allergic reaction to people who are allergic to plants in the Asteraceae family. That's common for herbs uh, that are in the Asteraceae family. So just keep that in mind, um, just like a, a general seasonal allergy. Dosage is one to four milliliters up to three times a day in a tincture or glycerite form. In a tea form, which I do frequently, especially for teething, I'll take tea and do drops of tea in a baby's mouth, uh, three to four teaspoons of dried herbs per eight ounces. All right, next herb we're going to talk about is one of my favorite, one of my absolute favorite herbs, and this is something you can just go right outside your door and probably get and make a tincture today, uh, and that is the poke plant. So the poke plant, a lot of people get this confused with the elderberry. Poke is actually that big plant with like the purple stalk with the big purple berries on it. Um, it's a weed, generally. Uh, we use the root of that plant. It grows rampant everywhere. Um, the root of that plant is incredible. Uh, it's anti-rheumatic, stimulant, anti catarrhal purgative, and emetic. And I'm going to explain those in a second because you've been hearing them a lot. So poke root cleanses the lymphatic glands, helps with respiratory infec infections, tonsillitis, mumps, mastitis, arthritis, enlarged thyroid, and enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, something to know is that in large doses, poke can generally be kind of toxic, uh, but more so it's a, just a powerful emetic and a purgative. So emetic means it enhances vomiting, like it produces you to start vomiting, and purgative means it does the other thing. It causes, a, it's a very good laxative, but it can cause it to the point where it can make you really, really sick, so just keep that in mind. This is why the tincture dosage is a half a milliliter up to three times a day in a one to 10 ratio. Um, for me, when I take it, I only take a couple of drops at a time, especially if I'm nursing. Uh, I put poke root on here specifically for mastitis. Um, mastitis is extremely common in lactating mothers, but it can also go downhill really, really fast to cause mothers to become septic. Poke root works almost every single time. Um, you take just a couple drops under your tongue for multiple days and the mastitis will go away. It's really great for breast health. Uh, it's really great for infections in general like that. Um, and it also, I, 
I also have it on there for the cleansing of the lymphatic glands. So if you're sick, you feel like you're getting sick or you've been sick, you need to take some poke root every now and then. Um, and then also important is that it's been used historically for mumps, which is another one of those diseases that can make a comeback um, in a crisis situation. So, But generally, the reason I put it in my apothecary cabinet uh, is for the mastitis and infection in general, but specifically mastitis. Next is wild cherry. Uh, specifically, the wild, wild cherry bark is what's used. It's anti-tusive, expectorant, astringent, and nervine antispasmatic. So wild cherry has a powerful sedative effect on the cough reflex. Uh, it's used for bronchitis, whooping cough, helps asthma, and pneumonia. So wild cherry is historically used in cough syrups. Um, and so if you have a cough, um, wild cherry bark is what you want to use. Do but large doses can be toxic. You need one to two milliliters up to three times a day in a tincture or glycerite form. You can also make a tea out of it, but you would actually need to make a deco de decoction since it is dried bark, which means you would actually boil it for 20 minutes instead of just steeping it in hot water for 20 minutes. Um, the reason I put this on here is obviously for its expect expectorant uh, abilities and its powerful sedative effect on the cough reflux. So it's one of those general um, medicinal things that you would want to have on hand. Next is white willow. Again, this is a bark that we use. It's, uh, it's anti-inflammatory, tonic, all of those wonderful things. Uh, it is the original source of modern aspirin. So it's great for rheumatism, gout, fever, and aches and pains. So um, when we made modern asp aspirin, we actually used white willow tree bark. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it does work the same way. Um, you just have to have a little bit higher dosage of it. Uh, just keep in mind it could interact with drugs that have the same aspirin-like abilities. It could enhance those. You would take a tincture three to six milliliters three or glycerate uh, three times a day. Um, so that's important to have on hand for a modern-day aspirin option when aspirin will not be available. All right, next is black elder. So we like to just say elder berries, but actually you can use the flower, the berry, or the leaf. Uh, all of them have pretty much the same properties, uh, in case you didn't know. So a lot of people have issues. The berries will be gone before they get to them. Listen, if you have the flowers and you're okay with it, just snip those flowers off uh, in big batches in the springtime and make your tinctures or your glycerites or dry the flowers out. Same effects as the berries, basically. Uh, so the leaf is, uh, there are a couple of differences. The leaf is purgative, expectorant, diuretic, diaphoretic, emollient, and vulnerary. The flower is uh, diaphoretic, antichotaral, antispasmatic, plus what the leaf is. And then the berry, um, although the, the flower is not as purgative as the leaf, the leaf has more issues because it's a little more toxic than the flowers are. The berry is diaphoretic, diuretic, laxative, and anti-rheumatic. So, you know, elder is best known to prevent the common cold and influenza. It lessens the symptom and duration of influenza. Elder berry made a huge impact in 2001. No, 2009, sorry. Um, 2009, uh, during the H1N1 outbreaks. And so there were studies done that showed that elderberry actually inhibited the replication of the H1N1 uh, influenza virus, and suddenly elderberry was very popular. Uh, so um, it does. That's what it does. It, it, it inhibits the replication of viruses in your system, specifically the common cold and influenza, and it lessens the symptoms and duration of those viruses. Uh, leaf is great for topical bruises, sprains, wounds, and tumors. The flower is great for colds and influenza and antiviral upper respiratory treatment. And the berry is all the same properties as the flower. Uh, this herb strengthens cell membranes to prevent virus penetration. So it's also a really good... Um, preventative herb to have on hand to not get sick. There are no known safety precautions except that in higher dosages, if you don't uh, make your protocol correctly, it can cause some nausea. And the dosage is a tincture of glycerite, two to four milliliters, three times a day. Like I said, I also like to make elderberry syrup with astragalus, uh, and you can take um, several tablespoons of that multiple times a day as necessary. Okay, the next herb on here, I told you we were going through a lot of herbs today. And we are. I'm not, uh, I am not skimping on herbs, but we only have a few more left. 
The next herb is comfrey. The parts that are used are the root, the rhizome, and the leaf. Uh, it's vulnerary, demulcent, anti-inflammatory, astringent, and expectorant. So comfrey is most known for its wound healing abilities. Um, it stimulates uh, all proliferation, so general uh, ability, internally and externally. Helps with ulcers, hernia, ulcerative colitis, bronchitis, slash cough, uh, especially the root and leaf. Uh, externally, uh, external wound healing, sorry, uh, of even large wounds. It also helps with fractures, ulcers, varicose ulcers, and it is anti-cancer. So we know comfrey most as helping with broken bones and fractures uh, and wound healing. So this is one of those wound healing herbs that you need to keep on hand. Uh, if you have a broken bone or an open gaping wound, comfrey leaves, if you've never seen them, they're huge. I would highly recommend you grow comfrey, uh, one of these herbs that we're talking about. Um, so that way you can dry it, keep it on hand, and place it on wounds. It's really important. Um, this is the main reason I put it on here for its wound he healing and bone healing abilities. Long-term studies show uh, hepatoxicity uh, with it, with carcinogenic um, abilities for this herb. Short-term internal use is suggested. I don't generally use comfrey internally. We generally use it externally. It's up to you. If you're going to use it internally, you can do four to two to four milliliters three times a day of the rhizome, um, or you can use the leaf uh, externally. Okay, quick, quick, hilarious break. Um, I'm watching out my window. We have turkeys, and um, our neighbor has stopped, and he is talking to the turkeys. It's great. It's wonderful. All right, moving on to our last few herbs. We have just two more. Two more herbs that we're going to go over. The first one is thyme, thymus vulgaris. Uh, yes, kitchen thyme. Uh, parts used are leaf and flowering top. It's carminative, antimicrobial, antispasmatic, expectorant, astringent, and, oh, what is that word? Anthelmanetic? Mm. I don't know how to pronounce some of these sometimes. It is a great digestive aid, infective wound, infected wounds, respiratory infections, digestive infections. It's a great gargle for tonsillitis and laryngitis. Great cough remedy, bronchitis, whooping cough, asthma. Thyme is another one of those herbs that is traditionally used in cough medicines, and most people don't know that. So it's really great um, to have thyme. When, but more importantly, it's also great as an antiparasitic. Uh, people use thyme um, all the time for their chickens and various different other animals. Um, but digestive aid for and for infected wounds is why I put it on here and for the respiratory tract. So it's another good one for whooping cough uh, and asthma for general uh, ability to heal the respiratory tract and for the digestive tract. Uh, infection, not only infected wounds, but infection in the body in general. But you need a lot of time. So I, I threw time in there because people tend to have it on hand. But uh, just don't worry. There are other options if you don't have time on hand. Uh, no known for sa safety precautions. Dosage of tincture of glycerite is 2 to 4 milliliters three times a day. Uh, the last and final herb I have on this apothecary list is stinging nettle. Uh, Urtica diorca. Parts to use are the aerial parts and the root. It's astringent, diuretic, tonic, and hypotensive. It is a whole body tonic. Uh, it, just great for overall health in general. I like to suggest stinging nettle for people who have some malnutrition and malabsorption ability or issues. Um, so it's also great for internal hemorrhage, which is one of the main reasons I put it on here. It helps lower blood sugar. It improves urine flow. And it's also wonderful, wonderful, wonderful for seasonal allergies, especially hay fever and rhinitis and sinus issues. Uh, fresh nettles can sting. That's why we call them stinging nettle. So internal use may decrease. Uh, also, internal use may decrease anticoagulant drugs. Let me say that again. Fresh nettles can sting. I said that before. It's really important to know. And then internal use may decrease anticoagulant drugs. Um, so this herb is on here because of its ability to heal the body in general. Great tonic. Drink it as a tea, take it as a tincture every day. Uh, great for internal hemorrhage um, and it seasonal allergies. You know, that's kind of just one of those things you want relief from. Uh, it grows generally all over the place in the United States, so you can also cultivate it as well. 
Um, and I went over the dosage. I'm not sure if I said that yet. Two and a half to five milliliters three times a day. Um, so that is the last herb I have on this list. I want to go over them again one more time. We have yarrow, agrimony, astragalus, oats, cayenne, balmony, fringe tree, hawthorn, Echinacea, ephedra, or ephedra, eyebright, meadowsweet, goat's rue, lobelia, German chamomile, poke, specifically the root, so I say always say poke root, wild cherry bark, white willow bark, black elder, either the flower, the leaf, or the berry, comfrey, thyme, and nettle, specifically stinging nettle. There are certainly other herbs that you can place on this list, but to get you started, these are the herbs that you absolutely need for your apothecary. Uh, and generally, most of them are easy to grow in most grow zones. So check them out. Write down your notes. Uh, you Maybe some of this isn't important to you. Maybe you only want a few of them. Uh, I would definitely have wound healing herbs, fever reducing herbs, herbs that are specific to things like typhoid uh, fever, uh, mumps, measles, uh, all of those things that can make a comeback quickly, malaria, um, and herbs that then are good for just general things, which are more commonly going to have like the common cold and influenza. Uh, but, you know, the reality is that in a crisis situation, if you're out in the country, you may not have, you may not get sick as often. Um, and so you pick and choose which herbs you want to add to your apothecary. This is a great place to get you started. Pick and choose which herbs you want of these. I suggest all of them. That's just me. Start cultivating an herb garden. Start playing with herbs because this is herbalism is such an incredible skill that we have lost over the generations. Our grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents, they could walk out into the yard or the field or the woods and they knew what something was for and they knew how to use it. It was just common everyday life. And I think it's really important that we get back to that. We don't need doctors saying that we don't know what we're doing, only they know what they're doing. We absolutely can know what are doing what we're doing and not that long ago we were treating our families at home. We were treating these situations at home until a doctor told us that we didn't know what we were doing. And so make sure that you start educating yourself with this herbalism skill. You don't have to be an herbalist. You can just be in in the know with the knowledge for your family to protect your family, to heal your family. Just start with your family. Start growing these herbs that pertain to your family and it will give you such confidence to know that you don't have to rush to the hospital. You don't have to rush to the doctor. Certainly those things are there for a very good reason. But in a crisis or apocalyptic situation, those things probably won't be available. And so you're gonna become your own doctor and your own hospital. Learn these skills now because when you need them, you have to have the skill already. It's not something that you can just up and try to learn in a crisis situation while it's happening. So just throwing that out there so that you kind of see the importance of herbalism and understanding how the human body works and how we can heal that body at home on our own homesteads and in our own lives. All right, guys, thanks for watching and listening today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel or the podcast, please make sure you do that for more information. Homestead Herbalist membership information is in the show notes below. And until next time, don't forget to choose simple.